Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house to worship you. We're honored to adore you, to give you the love that we have for you back to you. Father, we pray that this morning you'll take this service as our, as our gift to you. Father, especially this morning we're going to ask a special prayer for Jerry. Father, that you'll lift him up, that you'll lift the family up as, a, as they're in his final days. We just pray that you'll continue to strengthen them. Father, watch over them, protect them. Father, this morning just be with all of us. Watch over and protect all of us as we give to you that which you deserve from us. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Uh, you can turn the lights back on. We're not ready to do that yet. We, uh, we went to church camp a couple weeks ago. We've been waiting and waiting and waiting trying to get things together so that people can come up and tell you some things. Um, there's pictures on the computer of, of that. See those? Yeah. We can show those up here. We're going to ask... Um, do a couple things. That's something new I just sprung on you. But uh, we're going to actually do a couple things. Um, we had a great week at camp. We had, um, how many of them? 11 baptisms at camp? What was it? 13 at camp? Um, we found out that we had nine more since the kids went home, uh, which gives us about 20 or 22 kids that got baptized at camp, which is phenomenal knowing that we only had 60 kids there. Amen. All the other kids that were there were already baptized believers, something like that, so it would, the work that God did that week was great. Um, one of our own, Austin, you see Austin around here, she with a little funny hair and her sideburns. He got rid of the sideburns because I shaved one when, I, when he slept at my house. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he gets for falling asleep at my house. If any of you would like to sleep in my house, feel free. <laughs> well, wait a minute. We'll just but but you know, uh, Austin has been wanting to get baptized for several years. And uh, finally at camp, he called the grandma and said, Granny, Granny, please. He's been asking her. And she said when she saw him living the life, that she would allow him to do it. And she said, you're at camp. You're leading a bunch of kids. You're showing them Christ. She says, do it. So he did that. We were waiting. Every Sunday, Austin has been working. We thought he'd be here today, but he's stepping up. Lots of pictures of the baptism there. You see him doing it. And uh, we want to have Tiffany. Tiffany worked camp with us. We want her to come forward and share with you her feelings and stuff about what she experienced at camp as a counselor for the first time when she did. You were following from the house here. It was so offensive. We know you. Come on down. Or you can tell from right there in your seat. How's that? Um, and, uh, I just thought it was awesome to be part of that memory. It made me think a lot back to when I was baptized. Years ago. They don't know what you did. We didn't. Yeah. Well, I baptized when you were just to be some sort of. You didn't hear Tiffany uh, was a counselor with about eight girls, and uh, one of the girls in her dorm, not in her group, but in her dorm, who we followed with them and was with them, um, wanted to be baptized and asked Tiffany to do the baptism for her. Um, Tiffany says, I don't know. I said, it's an honor that someone would think of you that way and ask you to do that. And uh, Tiffany got to baptize the girl. And uh, when she got home, and she, I don't even know if she was home. I think she did it from her phone. She put on her Facebook thing, um, got a neat experience today, got to baptize a girl, and I can't stop smiling. If you look at her now, look at her smile. And it, is, it is a neat experience. And I try to tell everybody here, Frank went with us and some others, I mean, uh, Jake was there as a counselor, Austin's mother. I mean, I try to tell everybody, you don't have to be a camper to go to camp and learn about Christ. I mean, as much as Tiffany was leading and showing and doing, I'm sure she learned from those kids and those other things. She got to experience what it was like to uh, help, you know, I like to call it be a tool for God to bring another one to salvation. I mean, that's just a neat thing to experience. And it's an honor to have someone ask you to uh, baptize them. Be a part of that in their lives. You set them on that path to uh, eternity. So it's kind of cool. So 
we have Tiff Nielsen was in the uh, principal last time we had her. <coughs> she could share with us for show. I have a feeling about that. I don't know if she's coming on any of the questions. Are you coming on anyway? So you just do that to turn around and go back to the Long drive. So, um, well, it's kind of neat. We just wanted to share with you a little bit about camp. I wish Austin was here so you could pay some of the things you experienced. Maybe we'll have him do that for you. So, but, uh, just a neat time to see kids come to Christ and change their lives. Now we drop the lights and move whatever else we have. Yeah, Gina's here. We can start now. <laughs> these two were at camp. Yes, they were. Did he spend the night at your house? And yeah. <laughs> You guys have anything you want to say about camp? It was fun. Fun. I'm sitting over here, boy. She wants to know what happened to your hair. Uh, here. Were you at his house when it looks cool? We're turning over the worship band. Please watch.
number of past Sundays, we've heard from this scripture, 1 Corinthians 11th chapter, uh, as it relates to coming to the Lord's table. And I thought it would be appropriate if I uh, uh, chose the commentary from Matthew Henry. He, this is written in the 1700s. And uh, he has much to say on, on, this, on this issue of uh, meeting around the table. He says that as he comments on the scripture of Matthew, the 11th chapter, starting in verse 23, he reminds them of the nature and design of this institution and directs how to attend upon it in due manner. The apostle describes the sacred ordinance of which he had the knowledge of revelation from Christ. As to the visible signs, these are the bread and wine. What is he as called bread? Though at the same time it is said to be the body of the Lord, plainly showing that the apostle did not mean that the body, the bread, was changed into flesh. St. Matthew tells us our Lord did them of all drink of the cup, Matthew 26, verse 27, as if he would by this expression provide, prevent, provide against any believer being deprived of the cup. The things signified by these outward signs are Christ's body and blood, his body broken, his blood shed, all together with <clears throat> all the benefits which flow from his death and sacrifice. Our Savior's actions were um, the other. <clears throat> the actions of the communicants were to take the bread and eat, to take the cup and drink, and to do both in remembrance of Christ. But the outward acts are not the whole or the principal part of what is to be done at this holy ordinance. Those who partake of it are to take Him as their Lord and life, yield themselves to Him, and live upon Him. Here is an account of the ends of this ordinance. It is to be done in remembrance of Christ, to keep fresh in our minds is dying for us, as well as to remember Christ pleading for us in virtue of His death at God's right hand. It is not merely a merely in remembrance of Christ what He has done to suffer, but to celebrate His grace in our redemption. We declare his life to be our life, the spring of which all our comforts and hopes. And we, and we glory in such a declaration. We show forth his death and plead it as our accepted sacrifice and ransom. The Lord's Supper is not an ordinance to be observed merely for a time, but to be continued. And he goes on and he tells us that uh, that we should examine ourselves. And if we find any any uh, malice or hatred there, we should deal with that before we take. And Jesus taught us that if we have, if, you know, if if we cannot forgive others, God will forgive us. So it's important that we forgive others. And. <clears throat> Paul sums it up as far as you know, it's an attitude check that we go through. Paul sums it, sums it up in uh, 2 Corinthians, second note, uh, Philippians, the second chapter, starting at uh, verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant and being in, made in human likeness he, and bring, being found in appearance as a man, 
he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father.
seldom read, maybe a verse ere we fall into bed. Exhausted and sleepy and tired as can be, not from reading the Bible, but from watching TV. So then back to the table, side by side, is the Holy Bible and TV guide. No time for prayer, no time for the Word, the plan of salvation is seldom heard. Forgiveness of sin so full and free is found in the Bible, not on TV. Um, why is it that we know the Word of God has the power to change us. And if we know that the Bible has the potential for to protect us from sin, and if we know that Scripture has the ability to help us receive an abundant blessing from God, then why is it we're not in it? <clears throat> I want to talk to you today about the Bible, about the Word, uh, what God has given us so that we know what's going on. Um, you can pick any sport you want. They all have playbooks. You know, if you're watching baseball and it's on TV and, and you look down and they're, they're showing the third base coach, the third base coach is always doing something like this. <laughs> and what he's doing is he's giving instructions to the batter. And he's giving instructions to the runner if he's on base. So they know what play is in place. Now, what good is all of this if the batter or the runner don't know what he's doing? Or you go into a huddle of a football game and, and the, the quarterback says, okay, R17, L14. 
If I didn't study my playbook, I'd stand there going, I heard a lineman say at the SB Awards, he said, oh, I, I don't have to do much. I blocked the man in front of me. He says, and all I need to know is if it's straight, left, or right. Well, how does he know if it's straight, left, or right? Huh? By signals. By what's called. How does he know what's called? By his book, his playbook. He has a book that he looks at and he can see, well, R14 and L17 is this play. He knows whether it's a pass play or a run play. He knows it because he studied it. He studied it to the point that he doesn't even have to look at it anymore. As things are called, he just knows what they are. Easy enough. Matthew 7, 13. No. Matthew 7, 13. Anybody? For narrow is the gate, and then it's, and small is the path that leads to life, and broad is the gate, broad is the path that leads to destruction. You don't know that? I know that if I said John 3.16, someone would come up with that. Or where is it found, Cindy? Jesus wept? In Matthew, Mark, John. It's in John. You know that one. But if plays like that are called out, if we call out Genesis 1.1. Genesis and it... We need to know the playbook. How many of you are Christians? How many of you are living a life that Christ has, has led you to lead? How many of you know the playbook? So how many of you are truly living the life God has for you to lead? How do you know what God wants if you don't know the playbook? I want to point out several verses today for you that um, help us to understand some of this. Um, we can see that God's Word is spoken. Genesis 1, 1, Genesis 1, 1 through 3. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now that the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God's Word is spoken and it happens. How many things has God said in His Word that, that we believe? All of it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He didn't just speak it, He acted on it. How many of you can speak God's Word? Some. We know Jesus wept. We know for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through Him might be saved. We know that. We know some of those scriptures. We know 1 Corinthians 13. We know that it's the love chapter. We know Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. We know some of these things, but what does it say? And what do we do with it then once we know what it says? How many of us follow the playbook? We get up in the morning and, and our path is led because we are following the book. Or how many of us get up in the morning and do our own thing and every now and then a play slips in and we run it? In order to live by the playbook, we have to know. We have to know God's spoken word. We have to know that it's Bible today as it was the day He spoke. We have to know His written Word. In uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, we read these words. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, 
so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. Now, how many of us are thoroughly equipped? He's not saying, do you have your helmet on? He's not saying, do you have your shoulder pads? Ah, I forgot my hip pads, but that would be okay today. He's saying, are you thoroughly equipped to do the work of God? Do you know what he has for you to do? Do you have the equipment to do it? We talked a couple weeks ago about David and why David went into the battle with five stones. Why did he go into the battle with five stones? There were five, there were five guys. He was thoroughly equipped for that battle. Now a lot of us read that story and we think, well, five stones, one giant. No. He did not go into the battle thinking, I'm going to miss, I better take a couple extra stones. He went into battle with five stones, five people. That's pretty equipped, isn't it? To yeah. plan and know what he's going to do. I mean, are you thoroughly equipped? Are you ready to do every good work? God gives you an opportunity at the store. Do you take it? We were talking in Sunday school class and Melanie brought up a song that she was listening to and she said, the song says it takes 15 times for someone to really get it. What if you were that person's 15th person? What if you were the 15th person to tell that person and you did it? Because you were equipped. You were ready. I mean, what if a quarterback called a pass play and his receivers blocked the guy at the line and didn't go out? What's going to happen? Or he calls a play for the running back to come to his left side and get the ball and the running back goes to the right side. What happens? And yet we think it's okay every day of our lives to mess up. To do the Bible calls it sin. The Paul's question, should we then go on sinning? God forbid. Gang, if we're Christians, if we're living the Christian life, we have to know the playbook. We have to know the playbook well enough that we don't continue to sin. That each year we get a little bit better in our lives because we're able to cut these things out. But if we don't know the Word, how can we cut them out? If the Word's not there to convict you of a sin, that you, I've always done that. Well, it's okay if you've always done it, but now look what the Bible's telling you. It's wrong. You won't know it's wrong if you don't know the Word, if you're not in it. And we've got to be in the playbook. I mean, a little poem I read was talking about the Bible and the TV Guide, and it's, it's sad. I mean, we don't have the TV Guide in our house anymore. We used to get it. But it's sad how much the TV Guide or the Inquirer or the newspaper or something else is read but we don't have time for the Bible. That one thing that's going to guide us through this life. That one thing that's a living word, not telling us of history of the past or something that's going to be on. Something that's going to be on TV that we can fill our heads with that has nothing to do with salvation or life that we're living. But we've got to look at it. We've got to get it straight. So God's Word is spoken and it's real. God's Word is written and inspired and, and good for all things. All Scripture is God breathed. Then we read in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome. 
coming. You get that? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was what was the Word? Christ. And Christ is life. And anything that was made came from Christ. That life that is in us. That life that overcame darkness and darkness has yet to overcome it. Answer me this. Will darkness ever overcome the light? No. Why? We know that from Scripture, if you know your Scriptures, that He came and defeated darkness forever. Period. I mean, I have a lot of people that say to me, why don't we study the book of Revelation? Because it's too simple. Do you agree with that? The book of Revelation is too simple? God wins. God, God wins. wins. Satan mm -hmm. loses. I mean, that's what it's telling you. It's telling you all these things are going to happen and things we don't understand. And things. But it's a real simple book. God wins. Satan loses. If you choose His team, you win. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you what. I have in my life placed bets. I mean, I bet my kids that uh, they would get their room clean. I win all the time. <laughs> I, I bet about other little things, and I win. Now, how many of you would bet Tampa Bay Buccaneers will win the Super Bowl this year? How many of you would place that bet? Uh, I'm not sure. Couple of you are like, uh, <laughs> well, maybe. I mean, how many of you have ever bet someone just a friendly little bet? You know, wow! Well, I bet the Cowboys beat the, uh, the Redskins this year. That's a no-brainer. You know, maybe so, maybe not. But you have to see. Understand this. In this life, we're talking about in this word that is our playbook for life, and we do all this, it tells us this. No matter what happens in this world, no matter what goes down or how bad it gets, no matter the sin that creeps in and everything else that goes on, God wins, Satan loses. Amen. Who do you bet on? God. Who do you bet on? I'm waiting for the right answer. You're saying God, that's the church answer. Who are you betting on? How are you living your life? Who's in control of you? Do you know the playbook? Are you thoroughly equipped? Are you ready to take on any battle that comes on? Or are you kind of playing at it kind of haphazard? Are you that pro? that goes into the game ready to win. Are you like David, five stones for five men? Or are you like, oh, I better take me a shotgun because I don't know who I'm going to hit. I mean, you get what I'm saying? You can sit here and tell me you bet for God, but sometimes your life doesn't show it. I stand before you and tell you I'm God. And, it, and sometimes, again, you understand this, I don't show that. Sometimes if the world told me they would bet I was betting on Satan. But doesn't his things look so neat? Aren't they, aren't they tempting and tantalizing? I mean, anybody here not give in to temptation? Should we give in to it? Do you know what I read this week in a book? Oh, I forgot that book in a moment. In, I'm going to mess it all up. I'll have to get the book. In the cave with a lion on a snowy day. Is the name of the book. And in the book, the guy makes a statement. You may be playing on God's team, but sometimes you're a traitor. You may be playing on God's team, but sometimes you cheat for the other team. Sometimes you tell the other team what play is coming up. He tries to make his point. He says, he says, 
when you look at the back? Do you run to it or run from it? And in the book I'm talking about, he's telling about a story that's in the Bible of a man who sees a lion in the distance. And if you saw a lion in the distance roaring and coming at you, what do you do? What's your instinct? Turn and run. In this book, the man <coughs> ran at the lion. The lion turns tail and runs and goes into a cave and the man chases him into a cave. Psycho. What's wrong with that man? No, it's a man who fully believed in the victory that was going to be his. The man made the point. Some of us live lives and play with Christ as traitors. Some of us cheat on His team. When the battle's before us, we turn tail and we run instead of going headlong into that battle. Why do we not go headlong into that battle? We don't believe we can win. We don't believe we can win. We're not fully equipped. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can win the battle He puts before me because what? He's with me. Not only is He with me, He's ahead of me. Is He not? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What do those words in Psalms mean? What does that mean? He guides you. He directs you. He's there with you and before you. He goes before you to show you the way. And if He's showing you the way, if He's showing you that lion, why would you turn tail and run? Look at the stories in the Old Testament of the Israelites. Look at the battles they won. Look at the one we, we talked about two weeks ago when I was talking about Hezekiah. When they didn't think they could win the battle and God did what? Killed the armies while they slept. 185,000. Killed them while they slept. So the Israelites didn't have to draw a sword. That's the victory that God will give you if you run to the battle. If you believe. If you're prepared totally, completely for His good works. Gang, okay, His words here for us to see and to read. It's not just reading an old man, neat story. Man, Daniel Linus said a cool story. Why is it there? Why do they tell us about Abraham taking Isaac to the top of the mountain? Why do they do these things? So that we will face the battles before us. And you're never going to face a battle if you don't know the play. You're not equipped to face it. And it's not enough to know three or four verses by heart. you got to know the play. So that when someone says something, you can all make oh, well, that doesn't sound right. Something's wrong with it. Well, what, what, what did he say? Well, my God is this. But sometimes we're so easily swayed because we don't know the word. The word's not in us. Understand this. God will never be defeated. When this world comes to a complete end, and there's nothing left, God wins. And only those who play by the playbook, those who know Him and are written in His book of life, those who are obedient to Him and His will will be those who are victorious with Him. You can sit here today and act like a Christian. You can go out on the corner and profess it. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. But what did he call the Pharisees? I mean, gang, it's not a name that we wear. It's not a name we proclaim. What this book is is a lifestyle that we live. 
It's everything we are. It's everything we're about. It, 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 it should flow from us. When people see us, we say it all the time, they should see, they should see Christ. Do they see that in you? Psalms 119, verse 11. says these words. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. Thy word. Whose word? God's word. Have I done what with? Hid in my heart. Why do they use the heart? It's the life giver. It's, it's the pump. It's the thing that keeps us... It's the thing we call the temple of God. It's where God lives, we say. It's, all, it's there. I hide His word there so that I might not what? Sin against God. And if I'm not sinning against God, would I sin against you? Not if I'm living it. Not if I'm doing it. And we need to look at that verse. We need to have that as our model. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against God or against you. I wrote down several different versions. New American Standard puts it this way. Your word have I treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. New International Version. I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. New King James Version. Your word is hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. I mean, no matter where you take it from, no matter how you see it or what it reads, it reads the same thing. Okay? We have to put His word here. Here. So we don't sin against Him. If we don't have it here... We're going to fall for anything. That stump play that the defense is doing, we'll fall for it. You ever see him jump at the line and try to get the lineman to move? Sometimes they do, offsides, penalty. Why? Why? Who's the guy who gives out chicken legs? Can't think of his name. Turkey legs. Madden. John Madden said it. Fear. Fear of what? The opposition. We jump. We turn tail and run. We don't do the play that's called. We get frustrated. We get out of fear. Fear of the opposition. Fear what they might do. That guy in line has fear that this guy is going to clobber him. Gang, as we stand on the front lines for Christ, as we stand in that battle for Him, we can't jump off sides. We can't turn tail and run. We can't have any fear of the opposition. Don't get me wrong, we're going to have a, a healthy fear of, of Satan because we know what he can do, but we can't fear him. <laughs> we have to take it on. The battle comes our way, we fight the battle. Might get a little wounded. When we come out the other side, we're what? <coughs> Stronger, aren't we? Aren't we better off because of those battles? Isn't it the battles themselves that strengthen us? They talk about the heat, the fire, how it tempers the steel. I mean, it's those things. It's making it through the battles, making it through the temptations that get us through the other side, making us stronger. And once we have beaten that temptation, can Satan use it against us again? Great. I don't follow that anymore. I mean, we've got to see that. We've got to understand that. That there's a battle raging and we're the front line. And if we don't hold the line, the church crumbles. And if the church crumbles, then what? Huh? The world's not far behind it. Far, world's not far behind it. world's not far behind it. I mean, and understand this. God won't lose. We might lose. We might spend an eternity where we don't want to spend it. Those around us might follow us and go with us to that place. Eternal damnation. But God will not lose. Darkness will not defeat the light. Scripture. So who do you play for? Who do you fight for? 
whose book do you study? Whose plans, whose, whose plays do you study? Whose, whose do you put into your mind? Who do you get in here that you can repeat it up? How do you defeat Satan? The Word. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, He quoted what? Scripture. Again, it wasn't a mistake. It wasn't by accident. He knew how to defeat him, and he did. Now, we might think we're smarter than him or better than him, but I think if he knows that Scripture defeats Satan, that's good enough for Jesus, it's got to be good enough for me. I've got to start studying the playbook. You've got to start studying the playbook. We've got to get these words into our minds and into our hearts. We've got to know that his spoken word his written word, his living word, is still alive today. Just as important today as the day he did. That all scripture is God breathed, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good. We've got to know that. We've got to have it here, here. We got to be able to bring it out and tell people, man. When just as a quarterback calls the plays like I did earlier, when someone says John three sixteen, man, spit it out. Romans twelve one, Hebrews eleven one. I mean, you should know those. What's Romans three twenty three? All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. Man, you better know that. That means I've got Romans 6.23. The wage of sin is death. Understand that one. But, Scripture goes on, but the gift of God is eternal life. What I get for sinning is death, but God's going to give me a gift of eternal life if I obey, believe, have faith, do what He says. It's all there. We have to know those things. We have to be able to reverse them out and know that. Because if not, the wages of sin is death, and the death they're talking about is eternal death, damnation to heaven. That's what they're talking about. For you and me, if we're not doing this. So look at your life today. Are you thoroughly equipped? Are you ready? You walk out that door, the battle's going to hit you. Are you ready for battle? Have you clothed yourself with righteousness? Have you put on the armor of God? I mean, does He go before you in all things that you do? Can you hold that Scripture up? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and go forward in battle. Or do you power and run away? The mighty in God ran to battle. David didn't have a fear in him. He ran to the battle. It's time that we run to the battle. It's time that we, with God's Word, go forcefully ahead to take on this world and save it. To make a difference in our church. To make a difference in our community. To make a difference in our world. God requires us to run to the battle. If you're not ready to run to the battle, you need to look at yourself. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're not a Christian, you never give it up to Christ, so you're not in the battle at all. Maybe you might want to join us to fight this battle. Or if you're sitting here today and you call yourself a Christian, you have to answer the question, am I thoroughly equipped and ready for this battle? Only you can answer that question. Do I run to the battle or do I cower away? God's people run to the battle. If you have a decision to make today for Christ, we're seeing our, our hymn of invitation. If you have a decision to make, make that decision. Whether it's to become a Christian in a battle for the first time, or whether it's to say, God, you know, I've been playing, I, I don't know the playbook, I, I've got work to do, help me to get serious about what it's about that I can help to save lives for you. Make me a tool that's usable by you. 
Whatever your decision is, we sing our song today. Father, that it can strengthen our lives, that we can be your people, 
doing your work and your will. Father, just guide us and then direct us today. Father, be with us as we prepare for the baptism and the joyous time we know that as two saints come home to you. Father, just now be with us and guide us. Go with us this week. Make us strong. We pray in your son's name.